Hey everyone, and welcome to another Kanoa Reviews, where we review games both new and old on all platforms. If you like the content that I make, then please subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell so you never miss a review when it comes out. Today we talk about Final Fantasy XIV Shadowbringers, currently the last expansion released and pretty much the end of my Final Fantasy XIV journey, until Endwalker will come out in November. Not that I won't be playing the game in the meantime, currently I am discovering the joy of what the Hildebrand Mandeville quests are, but my reviews will take a break for a moment from Final Fantasy XIV until later this year. Shadowbringers had a lot to live up to, because it was according to so many FF14 fans, the best expansion ever, that also had the best story ever. If you've seen my previous reviews, then you know that I think the story in the vanilla, A Realm Reborn, is a bit average and then the story improves a whole lot with its first expansion, Heaven's Ward, only to be a bit more repetitive with Stormblood, though Stormblood improved on pretty much everything else except the story. So those were some big shoes to fill for Shadowbringers, especially because I had no idea what the story would be about. When we left off last time in the post-Stormblood quests, it had become apparent that Lord Xenos had somewhat risen from the grave again in the form of another Ashen taking over his body. The climax towards the end of Stormblood post-content is this awesome, massive battle with a great dungeon where it almost feels like World War I, with you and your group running through the trenches and artillery going off all around you while many troops are fighting one another in the background. During the build-up of this event, multiple scions have fallen ill all of a sudden by collapsing and not responding to anything. It's pretty clear that you will be the last one to have this happen to you, as you slowly start to lose your friends one by one. Some highlights before this event are an awesome meeting with all of the Eorzean leaders and the Grand Emperor himself. Another highlight is the fact that the Black Wolf, von Belsar, himself, has returned as well and now claims the Ashen hunting name Shadowhunter. Though I do by now have to say that it does start to look like Star Wars now, where everybody who died kinda comes back. You think Nidok is dead? Nope. He is back and takes over Estinian. You think Yotsuyu and Gosetsu are dead? Nope. Both back. Xeno's dead? Nope. Black Wolf dead? Nope. And in Shadowbringers, they also sort of kill off a few characters, but they yet return in the post content as well. I hope that with Endwalker, they will take a few daring turns again like they did with Heaven's Ward, where loss was properly felt with the death of Horshafon, Izel, and even, though she also comes back, the initiate feeling of having lost Nanamo. With Shadowbringers, the proper content starts where you are also fall ill and are teleported to a different world entirely which lays on the brink of destruction. Instead of the cliché being engulfed in darkness trope, this world is being engulfed in destructive light. In order to stop this, you have to become the warrior of darkness, the exact opposite of what you wear in your own world. I thought that this was a brilliant twist, and as mentioned, the fact that they now have Light as an enemy feels fresh and hasn't been done that much in other stories before. Light has always been the signal of hope, not despair, and they do a good job of portraying it in a destructive and threatening manner. The first impressions on the game's new zones is that they looked very pretty, though the initial purple forest was mostly aesthetically pleasing and not necessarily technical. The Crystal City, on the other hand, is a lot prettier and detailed than the cities we are used to, though Kugane will still be my favorite, not only because of the aesthetics, but also the scope of seeing all of the houses and the forts on the cliffs and the Crystal City does not have this. Seemingly, some of the cities we will explore in Endwalker go back to this giant scope once more, so I'm very excited for that. In the Crystal City, you will be welcomed by the mysterious Exarch, a character who, though shrouded in mystery, I had a pretty good idea of who to expect it to be, and I was right. This mostly was because the Crystal Tower content in A Realm Reborn had become mandatory, and this was done in a pretty late patch, already hinting at me that those events and characters would play a more important role later on. It is also at the gates of this city where you get attacked by your first Sin Eater, these white, marble-looking creatures that feast on the living and turn those who were injured in Sin Eaters themselves. Now let me just say that the beginning hours, maybe the first three or four of Shadowbringers, are absolutely perfection in tone, story, and build-up. It is great, and I was completely agreeing with people saying that this was the best story written and expansion yet for those first hours. You arrive in this mysterious, beautiful land and want to immediately explore it and learn more about it. 
The Crystal City is full of new intriguing characters to meet with and talk to, and when you hear that some of your friends have been here for a longer time, you immediately want to reunite with them and see how they changed. You first get the choice to either visit Alphano or Alizé. And though I like both characters a lot, the fact that Alizé apparently was in a desert area made me choose to visit Alphano first. I find desert areas in general very boring, is what I'm saying. And that whole area where you meet up with Alphano is also pure perfection in build-up and storytelling. You arrive at the shore and head over to the nearest town, which is this shamble collection of wooden huts where people barely have the necessities to survive. Here you meet up with someone who knows Alphano, and finally after your reunion, you learn more about the place you are currently at. With the inevitable destruction that awaits this world, a large group of people have holed themselves up in a larger city where they live out the rest of their days in pure bliss, luxury, and gluttony. The city apparently never gets attacked by the Sin Eaters and is completely safe. However, it is only available to live there for the elite and wealthy. Those who are neither will live in these shanty towns outside, including the one you arrived at first. The nearest shanty town at the border of the giant wealthy city is a bit more special though, since many of the people there are poor, but every now and then these two spokesmen, who were these two jesters, appear and recruit certain poor folk to come and live in the city in exchange for work, like cooking, cleaning, or sometimes a bit more specific like art. This is the chance for the poor folk to live out their days in safety and luxury in the city, and even though they probably will only get scraps to eat when they go and live there, chances are likely that it's a lot better than what they are eating now. Those who are not chosen or recruited still get special food that resembles baked bread from the city. The later reveal on what that food actually is was a very cool twist, and I personally did not see it coming. In order to try and enter the city as well, you and Alphano come up with a few plans to be recruited and the one that actually works is where Alphano's artistic talents are utilized, which they already hinted at in earlier expansions too. It was really cool that they used this small detail that had already been established and not pulled something out of thin air. So then you get recruited and pose as Alphano's assistant, and are finally able to enter the giant city. You need to go through a whole process of being registered, getting cleaned, and going through the bureaucratic steps in order to get your valid permits. It sounds stupid, but this was still absolutely amazing storytelling and build up to me, and it made me realize that I thought it was all so engaging, whereas all I was doing was running from place to place or person to person and simply clicking one button each time. Now granted, the game has a lot of this in the beginning, but some of the times it does indeed feel grindy, or like you are just doing chores and going from person to person of just talking. And those parts in Shadowbringers are no different, but the context this time is so different to where it all has weight and it has fully grabbed your attention, as you want to know what's next. You see, it's not like with Heaven's Ward, where you already know your goal, which is to go and meet the dragons or stop the Archbishop. Or with Stormblood, where the entire time the story revolves just around going from place to place, doing chores to gain people's trust and recruit them for a rebellion. With the first part of Shadowbringers, I had no idea what was going on, or where the story would take me. Every time I thought, what is waiting for me around the next corner? And that build-up of the zone where you meet Alphano is just brilliantly paced, with first exploring and doing quests in the shanty towns, then learning more about the dynamic between the city and the poor, and seeing this first hand in the gay town. You then come up with a plan of how to get in, execute it, and then you're in the city, and now have to go through this specific routine before you are free to do some reconnaissance. It is marvelous and pure bliss for story and lore lovers without actually giving that much action. You can easily spend 40 minutes or so of just talking, and though that might sound boring, and I should know that earlier parts in A Realm Reborn also have this and then it actually is a bit boring, but here it is so interesting and captivating that I was kept at the edge of my seat the entire time. It also comes all together in a brilliant climax where you meet with the giant lord Valthry, who has seemingly struck a deal with the Sin Eaters to keep the city safe. He is a brutal tyrant that will suffer no disobedience and will not hesitate to throw anyone who dares say something back off the balcony in his palace. It's kind of interesting to me though, how seeing how sensitive and easily offended everyone is nowadays, that Final Fantasy does get away with a few things, whereas I'm sure that World of Warcraft would have many people whining and complaining about it if they did the same thing. Now besides of course the horrible practices that have it at Blizzard, which are awful, I know that there are some out there who feel like making the bad guy very fat uh, is fat shaming, or of course the portrayal of female characters in skimpy clothing is also not to some's liking. 
Yet Valtteri is an enormously obese character, and the new dancer job basically has your character in skimpy and sexy clothing. Now, I personally don't find this offensive at all, but I do feel like Final Fantasy gets away with some things, whereas Warcraft wouldn't. Let's also briefly talk about the new races, with the bunny girls from Final Fantasy XII, and actually playing Final Fantasy XIV had me want to play Final Fantasy XII again, and I'm now about 10 hours or so into that game, and I think the addition of this race is a great addition. They look great and fit right in, and even when hearing some references like the city of Rabanaster or Dalmasca gave me nergasms. I will say that I'm not sure I like what they did with the voice actors though in the English version. They very much go for a Slavic, Scandinavian feel for them with the actors coming from Iceland, etc. But it sometimes makes it to where the acting is quite a bit off. The main bunny girl you interact with, which is the captain of the guards of the Crystal City, does a fine job of performing her lines, but at a certain point there comes a time where some pretty sad and dramatic voice acting needs to be delivered, and it doesn't really manage to hit the target. It more feels like a non-native English speaker trying to focus on properly pronouncing the words and text, but then not being able to put as much emotion into that delivery. Anyway, back to what is so great about the game. The story. So after you encounter with Lord Valtteri, you return to the Crystal City and then embark on your next journey to meet up with Alizé. As said, this is a desert area, and yeah, desert areas are not the most interesting, but yet again, here they deliver a great experience purely through the story and build-up. You start out as you and a fellow traveler cross the desert and stop at a small town full of kobolds. I mentioned in my Stormblood review how I kinda disliked the approach there of going from town to town and doing just chores to win over the people's trust. It's repetitive, not very exciting, and the story itself does not gain anything from it. The fun thing here is that for a brief moment, the game kind of jokes at you that you have to do the same by suggesting you have to do chores to win over the Cobalt's trust. At that moment, I rolled my eyes and thought, oh no, here we go again. But instead, the game throws you a curveball and you have to participate in this funny little event where you have to showcase your patronage to one of the shops there. You get this funny interaction with the shop owner and can choose any sort of wacky food to spend your coins on. It's hilarious to see all the shop owners come barging in on you to convince you to go to their store, and pretty much after this event you are good to go and continue your journey. It was almost like the game knew and said, yeah, sorry for some of those chores we had you do in earlier games. And so you continue on and finally meet up with Alizé at a small camp where they give medical aid to those who are affected by the Sin Eaters. You don't yet know it then, but those that were affected will worsen over time and inevitably turn into Sin Eaters themselves. There's a pretty simple but quite emotional scene where you have to go back to the goblin camp and get a nectarine or tangerine or some sort of fruit. You might think, ugh, I have to go all the way back there just to get some fruit? But it then gets revealed that this will be the last meal someone will get before they will be euthanized. The medical staff asks everyone what their favorite food is. Then when their condition has worsened so far that they have to be put out of their misery, then they put some poison in that food so that they die but still have some great memories of eating their last favorite meal. It added a whole lot of new depth and weight to such a simple mission, and I was yet again so invested in this area, its characters, and its story. Here too it comes to a gigantic climax, with a side character, who you think will be quite important, getting brutally stabbed by one of the Sin Eaters, and then turning into one themselves in a sequence that is actually quite frightening and tragic. You later have to kill her in a dungeon, which lies heavy on Alize's conscience, but it adds just all the more drama and investment in the story. Unfortunately, I don't think any other real big losses happen in the story. I could maybe be forgetting one or two, but I, uh... I don't think any other important side characters dies on the good side. Yeah, again, I wish they would up the stakes a bit and give you a sense that you have something to lose because you don't want to get that feeling that everyone is safe all the time or being brought back from the dead, which takes away from the dramatic twists and turns. And so for these first two zones in a couple of hours, Shadowbringers had me hooked and I thought this was indeed going to bring the storytelling and experience to a next level. Unfortunately, however, they do that shtick, which I usually don't like in story-based video games, and that is to already clearly state the goals you have to do from that point on out. Pretty much the story then turns into go to A, B, C, and D, and take out the main Sin Eater there. And that's it. Sure, there are some smaller stories and drama within those areas, but the overall storyline then yet again kind of takes a pause and it turns into a bit of repetitiveness, since you know that once you kill the Sin Eater in Zone A and B, 
you will have to do the same thing again in the next area. It even becomes repetitive in the nature that at the end, each time the armies belonging to Valtteri will come and follow you to stop your plans. And so, yeah, unfortunately the story then by that point takes a step back. Now it never becomes bad or mediocre, but it did not captivate me for a while like it did with those first two zones. Luckily, those next zones you'll be playing at are very pretty though, and have plenty of other stuff to make it interesting. The Land of the Fairies, for example, looks gorgeous and is easily the prettiest zone so far with sprawling flower fields, hobbit-like houses in the hills, a crystal clear lake, and caves that house these funny dog-type creatures that live in giant, illuminating mushrooms. It all looks like it came straight out of a fairy tale or a children's book. Everything is so colorful and vibrant, it's a true joy to explore and see. Unfortunately though, some of the quests here are very much chores you have to do and don't feel all that important. It basically comes down to doing chores in order to get certain artifacts with which you can open the entrance to the castle housing the Sin Eater in question. That particular fight though is excellent and very fun with a great trial where a lot of movements and mechanics are yet again required and I'm glad they kinda upped the difficulty with those, some of those dungeons and bosses. The dungeons and boss fights in Vanilla Realm Reborn pale in comparison and honestly feel a bit bland and boring with barely any mechanics. It kind of feels like the creators know that by now the ones playing the game are those who paid for it and they are there to stay and willing to put in effort. They can then make some changes in difficulty and make it a bit more challenging. Now mind you, it's not super difficult, but I believe the group I was with wiped twice on this particular Sin Eater boss. Now you might also notice that I'm skipping to talk about the dungeons, but I'm going to talk about that later. Also, it should be said that I absolutely adore Uriange with how he has become. He was one of the most unlikable characters in A Realm Reborn, not because he was a douchebag or anything, but he had barely anything to do. Most of the time you forgot that he was there. He got some more death thanks to Moonbrita and with the Warriors of Darkness, but he was still the odd man out. Now with his new awesome look and his playing cards that he uses to heal with, he is now one of my favorite characters. I cannot help but to always think of Yu-Gi-Oh when I see him, how he deals with the cards. There's even a cutscene at the end of 5.3 where he lays all of his cards on the table, then thinks really hard and in a dramatic fashion grabs a tiny piece of cardboard only to reveal he grabbed the card he needed. It is so cheesy and maybe even a little bit cringe, but I simply love it. It was that heart of the cards bullcrap, which I also love with Yu-Gi-Oh. You also in this area have the little fairy who calls you her sapling, and I actually really disliked her character and mostly voice in the beginning, but really grew to love her in the end. I found it very funny that she often spoke in a cute and high-pitched voice, but in the same sentence would suddenly let out a giant roar when she was angry or annoyed at something. But then once you are done with the fairy area, you head on over to the next area, which is another forest, where you meet up with Master Matoya, aka Stola, who by now looks hotter and more waifu-esque than ever. Yeah, the creators know that she is the favorite with most fans, I think. Her new outfit, which is this giant black dress with fur and feathers at the top, gave me very much Lulu vibes from Final Fantasy X. Ah, which I also have been starting playing again, and am now around 8 hours or so in. Honestly, playing Final Fantasy XIV and seeing all the references and fan servers just makes me want to play all of them again. Seeing Ultros in the Manorville storyline made me want to play VI again. Ah, <sighs> damn. So many Final Fantasies, so little time. This area, with Ishtola, is pretty, though it is yet again one of those many forest areas. The most unique thing about it is this really bizarre but strangely fun music. There's this woman who kinda sings Celtish or chanting something, and it starts every time you are done with visiting a village or watching a cutscene. And the first sentence she says is really loud, so it always caught me off guard. So yet again, with this zone, the story in and of itself isn't that special. You are looking for a way to unlock the area where the Sin Eater is and have to do some trials and puzzles to solve it. The overall story yet again doesn't really continue, but the cool thing about this zone is that they have an Indiana Jones style temple laying in wait for you, where you have to solve various riddles, perform certain tests and puzzles, and even have to do certain events like running away from giant boulders. I mean, it's very much a big wink to Indy Jones, and it's great. The side characters that you meet here, like the bunny girls or the lying people, are okay, but nothing more than that. By now though, you are also accompanied by the Ashen Emmet Cell, who is a true highlight of this expansion. 
His acting and delivery is marvelous, and he's both very menacing and charming at the same time. It's also here where a pretty cool plot twist appears, which unfortunately in the end they don't do a whole lot with. But when it's revealed that you, as the Warrior of Darkness, are absorbing all the light of the Sin Eaters within you, it was a pretty dramatic reveal that you might be turned into the biggest Sin Eater of them all, if you were to continue this. It added another layer and drama to the story, which was welcome. But then I am sorry to say that we arrive at the point in the game where it kinda lost me and I'm surprised to find that many others never talk about this point in the game. You see, so many fans talk about Shadowbringers as if it's the perfect expansion, with no flaws whatsoever. But in my opinion, the zone that comes after this, which is yet again in the same desert as where you met with Alize, but this time the west of it, it was actually pretty boring. Yes, I have to admit that I actually got bored during part of this expansion. See, this zone and questline fully revolve around finding a way to fix a trolley. Sounds very thrilling, I know. Now, were you to fix it with one or two quests, then it would not have been much of an issue. But pretty much the entire zone revolves around this, and for multiple hours, all that you will be doing are chores and collecting things to get the trolley up and running again. It's honestly really quite dull, I'm very sorry to say. The characters you meet here aren't very fun or interesting. The story doesn't really go anywhere. And it kind of revolves around Minfilia, who by this point now comes to terms with that she's her own person and refuses to live like so many past iterations of her have and will adopt the name Reen. That storyline is actually quite interesting, but it's a shame it's done in this particular zone where the story is so forgetful. Even the dungeon here is the worst of them all, and it's just also very forgetful. Don't get me wrong, I love Shadowbringers and think those first few hours are brilliant, but it's not the perfect expansion without any flaws. I also have to say that with so much hype surrounding Shadowbringers as fans have it led up to be, it kind of was impossible to live up to that hype. As I said, I have seen videos of people stating that Shadowbringers has the best story in any video game ever, or at least in their top three, but I cannot agree with that. Don't get me wrong, I think the story is great, and especially for an MMO, it's undoubtedly the best one out there. But I've played games like Bioshock Infinite, Metal Gear Solid, Yakuza, Final Fantasy IX, which all had stories that I think were better. So I cannot join the camp of labeling this game's story as one of the best in gaming in general, but I can definitely join the one that states it has the best MMORPG story. Anyway, so after you are done with, in my opinion, the worst zone in the expansion, the game fortunately returns back to its former quality as you return to the luxurious city full of sloths to go and kill their leader. Shadowbringers is yet again full of awesome single player duties, and they have really improved upon these over the expansions and years. Throughout the Shadowbringers main campaign you will partake in multiple large-scale battles that feel epic and eventful. Whether it's fighting against the invading army of Lord Vothry as you try and rescue Minfilia, or holding off an army of Sin Eaters as you run across the battlefield along with your comrades. Even though it's single-player content, the battles themselves against bosses and important characters are awesome, and they use enough mechanics to also make these very engaging. You have to dodge a lot, or use unique abilities only available during that specific scene. Some of the bosses do overstay their welcome a bit, and first I thought it was because I was playing as a bard, one of the weaker DPS types, which it also has because it's a support role. But I heard some other friends say that the battles for them lasted quite long too. Before you reach Valtry's dungeon, you have another quest chain on how to activate a giant golem, which ends with a great climax as a titan looking rock monster holds up an island into the air. Right when I saw this majestic image, I thought to myself, hmm, it would be cool if the dungeon would actually be us walking on that titan's body as we make our ascent to the island. And lo and behold, that is exactly what the dungeon was. And with that, I want to finally talk about something that I think does not get enough recognition with Shadowbringers. Fans and others keep talking and talking about how good the story is, and I've already shared what I think about that earlier. But I don't hear enough people talk about how absolutely fantastic and brilliant the dungeons are in Shadowbringers. And don't underestimate the power of what a dungeon experience can do. Back in World of Warcraft, or even something like the Old Republic, I was always excited to do a dungeon because it's almost like a standalone story or setting with awesome boss battles that you and your friends will tackle together. And the dungeons in A Realm Reborn 
kind of sucked. The first ones were all just murky, dark hallways without much flavor to them. But now, Final Fantasy XIV has actually turned out to be the game with easily the best dungeons I have ever played in an MMORPG ever. I cannot emphasize enough how good they are. Because rather than dungeons, by now they feel like something else entirely. A separate awesome set piece within that narrative. They already made great improvements with the dungeons in each expansion since Heavensward, but I feel that it really was lifted to a next level with Shadowbringers. The first dungeon you do is this battle in the open fields as a nearby village gets attacked by Sin Eaters. You see smoke on the horizon, corpses piled next to the road and civilians screaming and running past you. It's all very epic and cinematic and really makes you invested and suck up all that atmosphere and storytelling within that dungeon experience. What is also a really, really great addition with Shadowbringers is the addition of having NPCs being able to help you in the dungeons. Before, you of course were always relying on either friends or strangers to do dungeons with, and I know that there are some who don't like to play with others they don't know personally. And though I myself don't mind, I do have to say that I hate the types of players I find in a duty finder who just rush the dungeon and try to get it over as quickly as possible. Now with Shadowbringers, I don't have to worry about this. The NPCs will just follow my tempo, and so I can take it as slowly as I feel comfortable with. The NPCs which you can often choose from are your familiar set of faces like Thancred, Ishtola, Alphano, Alice, Urianche, etc. They will even add a bit of flavor as they will comment on some things that happen through the dungeon. They are all quite competent in figuring out the mechanics, though I did die once due to Alice not moving away from me when we were all supposed to spread out. Maybe it was her sass, where she, instead she thought it was me who was supposed to get away from her instead of she get away from me, but anyway, jokes aside, it's a great addition and now with these NPCs you also don't have to wait for 10 or 20 minutes sometimes to get into a dungeon group. You can immediately hop in and continue the main quest. Because I actually really like that the dungeons are mandatory in the FF14 campaign experience, but it's a real flaw if you have to wait for 20 or 25 minutes to continue it. The worst was in Stormblood, where I waited for almost 40 minutes and you can't really do a whole lot else while waiting, so it became very boring. In that sense, I think it's even smart to implement that system in earlier dungeons as well to always guarantee that you can play the dungeons and continue the main campaign. And the truth of the matter too is that the addition doesn't mean that all the people will immediately start using these NPCs for their dungeon runs, because it has a great balance between plus and minus points so the plus points I just mentioned. But, if you play with the NPCs, your dungeon run will be significantly longer than with players. The NPCs simply won't do as much damage, and are not inclined to pull as many enemies. By average, I would say that your dungeon run will be 15 minutes longer than where you to do it with regular players, and I know that for many, that is a lot of time wasted. So the people that just want to rush ahead can still stick to the regular people, and others can use the NPCs for a more chill experience. I will say though that also with the NPCs fighting the trash mobs definitely is pretty boring. I had a good time of fighting the dungeon bosses with the NPCs on my side, but the trash mobs turned into me just going over my button rotation without having to worry at all since there would be no human error or surprising events. So again, it's a bit more boring and lengthy if you play with the NPCs, but you get some more flavors in the form of their conversations and can completely go through it on your own tempo. No need to worry about getting left behind, getting lost, or watching a cutscene while others are waiting. Brilliant. But as mentioned, not only that mechanic is great, the dungeons themselves are too. There's so much variety with the dungeons, as the second dungeon is this beautiful Alice in Wonderland-esque garden and castle that you run through and it feels so fairy tale like and surreal. It's unlike any other dungeon you have played before, with yet again bosses that have fun mechanics. The weakest dungeon is in that boring part with the trolley, but the journey to Vothra's Island is great too, with it starting on this colossus while pieces of rock fall near you and the Sin Eaters get punched and crushed out of the sky. It even ends with this beautiful climax with you arriving at this very Greek inspired city full of marble buildings and pylons. It really feels like the Sin Eater's home and in general I felt like there was a Greek overtone with some of the visuals here in Shadowbringers. Vothri's attire was very ancient Greek. His city had that vibe, but even when you descend into the ocean to the underwater city it feels like you are traversing towards the underworld or limbo. 
and the end boss's name can of course also not be denied within that Greek picture. Vothri's fight itself is also tough, but very cool, where halfway through his grotesque baby-like self suddenly turns into this hot-looking Greek god dude. Someone in chat when that happened typed, oh no, he's hot. And that's the same thought I had back then, so it kind of made me laugh. Once you defeat him, as mentioned, you then head down towards the bottom of the ocean, where you meet up with the Sahagin. It's also a fun nudge back to the whale you fought before, as it is this creature that transports you over there. Here the game reaches its end in a series of events that in all honesty reaches yet again that level of brilliance as the first four hours did. I kid you not that I was astounded to find the underwater city, which was so beautiful and so mysterious, sprawling all the way over the bottom floor. It gave me Bioshock vibes, but it was also very much like New York, all somber, dark and abandoned. Throughout the streets you see these tall, mysterious, ghost-like figures, which are fragments of people that used to live there. You can really feel the weight of walking across the city that was for a time brimming with life and now only had death and sorrow to its name. Now the city and its inhabitants are kind of conjured up by Emmett Selk, and you can have some pretty interesting discussions with the inhabitants where they themselves don't know the answers to many questions you have, for they seem to have a limited perspective or memory since they are conjured up. There is a really beautiful and memorable scene, where you are waiting in a hall, since here too everything goes through bureaucratic steps, on talking to the higher ups in the city. You sit on this bench and the large ghostly figure next to you talks with you about the history and essence of the Ashens and what has become of them. It honestly is a real powerful and also pretty sad moment since the Ashens talking knowing about the death of its people, probably even realizing he himself is not real either. But once you walk away, he actually admits that he can see the presence of Ardbert, the warrior of darkness who you fought before, is right beside you. It's the first time in the game someone can sense him, and it's a really good and emotional payoff for that. Then the final dungeon is yet again amazing, as you go through the final hours of the destruction of the Asian city. As you traverse the streets, meteor showers rain down on the citizens in the buildings, and it's really epic and large in scale. I have never played any other dungeon in other MMOs where the dungeons were of this epic scale. The final fight is then also very cool, and it ends beautifully with you restoring balance to the realm and bringing peace to Ardbert. I guess I will also talk briefly about the post content, since I will be doing another review of FF14 until Endwalker comes out. The first patch is always pretty light on story, and here revolves around how to get your friends back to the realm where you are originally from. Though the story might not bring any surprises with it, the dungeons yet again continue to be absolutely amazing. The first dungeon is this beautiful castle with lush gardens and majestic halls. It feels very different from all the other castles you have already fought in before. Great work on the art department there. Then the second dungeon is where you return to the underwater city, this time all calm and tranquil, but the introduction section is very cool with you riding on the giant whale's back while monsters attack you along the way. Then the next dungeon is you running through most of the Shadowbringer zones as all these people and creatures that you met along the way help you fight off the invading monsters. It was a great goodbye letter to all the adventures you witnessed during Shadowbringers. I even caught myself slash waving to some of them as I knew this was goodbye, and just thinking about that section gets me so pumped and brings a smile to my face. It's like those moments in movies where suddenly everyone helps one another despite their differences or opinions. Something, honestly, this real world could use more of. Basically from the post patches up, the main bad guy becomes Elidibus once again, as he has taken over the body of Ardbert. He is yet again scheming to bring forth the apocalypse in his one true god Zodiac, and the climax that reaches when confronting him is also one for in the books. He basically becomes the embodiment of the Warrior of Light, the guy from Final Fantasy 1's art, the actual OG character. It's more recently has been made more famous due to Dissidia, but if you look up the art for Final Fantasy 1, you can find him with his long white hair and his metal horned helmet. And the fight itself is also awesome, and really tough. We wiped probably four times or something during this battle, but boy was it awesome, with a great music score in the back. Then in the story, when you're finally back to your own realm, the campaign starts to focus and works its way towards Endwalker, with yet again bringing back a character in the form of Yotsuyu's brother, though this time it's been overtaken by another Ashen. 
And I do have to say that it does feel a bit tiring with the same formula of, oh, you killed this Ashen. Now there's another Ashen. And after you kill that one, there's yet another Ashen, who's even more powerful or evil. Not very original in that regard, but from what I understand, Endwalker is going to be the end of this particular story arc, so hopefully, after that, we will get something entirely fresh and new. Because I heard that Endwalker will not be the final expansion or content for Final Fantasy XIV, but it just will be the end for this particular story content. The story of course also continues with Lord Xenos, who is still very cool, but he has become a bit of that cliché, badly written bad guy of someone who just blindly wants to kill you. Nothing else matters, and he just waits for that ultimate clash with you. There's no real ambition there, or greater plan or development. It's simply that he enjoys the hunt to the fullest, and you, his friend, his enemy, are the ultimate prey. But even though he has the personal depth of a peanut, he is still very cool and charismatic, and I'm happy to see him new and restyled with an awesome scythe for Endwalker. The very final mission before the next expansion was also really cool, with you and the other Scions fighting a giant army of monsters accompanied by Lunar Primals. The army that you side with now also consists of all the beast tribes, and so it was great to see soldiers from Ulda or Limza fight alongside Sahagin soldiers, Kobolds and more. The giant battlefield really has a Lord of the Rings feel to it, with all these different armies, and you also get to play as many different characters for the first time, including Uriange or Alizé. And then, when everything is said and done, you can do nothing more but to gaze up towards the moon and wonder about the adventures you will have when the next expansion drops. Shadowbringers, in the end, is one hell of an awesome expansion. Not flawless, like some make it appear to be, but an improvement on many levels, most notably the dungeons, and it has narrative and story moments that are absolutely brilliant. In this case, the first hours and the final ones. It is a huge step up compared to Stormblood, and though it did not take as many daring chances with characters' deaths or twists like Heaven's Word did, it still improved on gameplay aspects compared to that old expansion. In the end, Shadowbringers gets an 8.9. I am very curious to see if Endwalker will pull it off to become the greatest FF14 expansion yet. The cool thing in my opinion is to remember that this huge Final Fantasy XIV hype only started around two months ago, with its like 600% of population increase. Though it of course already had its share of hardcore fans, this more mainstream recognition is fairly new. And so that could in theory bring some pressure or choices that the creators would do to please the masses that in practice are not very fun mechanics or ideas. But the cool thing is that Endwalker of course was in development during the time where it still had its share of hardcore fans only. Endwalker is not going to be a product that needs to appeal to the masses or everyone, because it was still made with that same mindset. And because of that, I have trust in the creators and creating something very special, and I cannot wait where the story will take us, and what awesome battles and monsters we get to fight next. I will see you all in November, when Endwalker launches.